Well, we are finally here at the close of the book of Genesis. It has been over a year as we've been going through this book. And ta-da! We've crossed the finish line. Does it feel good? Are you tired? Do you need to go back and stretch? It has been a great journey as we've been going through this book. And in Genesis, the book of beginnings... Lay so much of the foundation that we need as we continue to go through the rest of the Bible. And, and you know me, I, I, like just, I don't like to think about what's going to come next, so I have this urge just to go to Exodus next, and then Leviticus, and keep moving all the way down until we get to Revelation. That would take a little bit of time, wouldn't it? It's not exactly what I'm going to do, but, but kind of maybe later. But as we've been looking at Genesis, what I want to, to share with you today is the fact that Genesis not only is a foundational book for our understanding for the rest of the Bible, but in this last chapter we are given, I'm going to call it, our goggles or or lenses through which we can look at everything that's already happened and prepare ourselves for what is to come in the revelation of God's history that we've been giving or what we call redemptive history. We are now given these goggles that helps us to understand what has happened and help us to look forward to what is to come. It's like this. When you go to a a 3D movie, they give you the goggles or the glasses before you go in, right? Last time we did it was at uh, the Butterfly Wonderland over there in Scottsdale. We, We got to go to the Butterfly Wonderland, and they show everybody this video about the monarch butterfly and how it travels from, like, Mexico to Canada, I think, it like travels that far. It's pretty amazing. It, but it, it takes actually three generations to make it all the way to the top. And then, then the one mega butterfly makes it all the way back down. That's pretty cool. Like just watching that was pretty amazing. But it's a 3D video, so like the butterflies are coming at you and it was cool to watch the girls. <coughs> they hadn't seen that, or at least Sam's never seen it before. So what do you do when you're first seeing a 3D movie for the first time? You go, what? <laughs> Right? You have to take it off and see what, what it really looks like on the screen. And it's just kind of fuzzy. And then you put it on. And then you have to go like this a little bit. Because it's right in front of you. It's just really fun. And, and, and so watching them do that. And Sam especially going, wait a second. And then all the butterflies are like all around you. Well, those goggles help you to see the picture the way that the director has intended for you to see it. You could, if you wanted, take the goggles off and watch the whole thing without them. It just probably would give you a headache. You wouldn't understand what it is. Everybody else around you would be going, wow, that's so amazing. And you'd be going, what? What's so great about this film that's out of focus? You wouldn't be able to see the film the way it's intended to be seen until you have the glasses. Well, that's what the book of Genesis really does for us. It it sets up so much foundational work for us. It gives us the goggles through which we're supposed to see the rest of the Bible that if we don't understand some of these foundations, it becomes skewed. Then we understand exactly what God is doing, especially if you were to jump right into maybe some of the histories and you start reading in, in Samuel or Kings, Judges, and you start going, what is wrong with the Bible? Because you wouldn't have that foundation. It really wouldn't make sense to us. And so this morning, I want us to look at some of these lenses that we've been given. Because even this last chapter, if we don't understand these lenses, the lenses of God's sovereignty, the lenses of of God's covenant promises, remember that's been such a big, important theme throughout the book of Genesis. That creation God creates... He makes all things good. God is not the creator of evil. So when we look out in the world and and it doesn't look like the way it should and and, and death and disease and and despair and depression and wars, all this stuff that goes on, that's not right. And it's good for us to recognize that that's not right. Even when you turn on the Discovery Channel and you're watching Shark Week or something, you see these animals killing other animals. Even that's not right. But we say, oh, but that's, that's just nature. Yeah, it is nature now. But it's not the way that it's supposed to be. Sharks are supposed to be just these friendly little things, kind of like dolphins, probably. I don't know. 
But they're not supposed to be things that are going to eat your leg if it thinks you're a fish. The world is not supposed to have death and decay and sickness. It's not the way it's supposed to be. But we can recognize that if we look through the the lenses that we've been given from Genesis 3. That, oh, now I understand. The the sin entered this picture in the fall. Adam and Eve came in. They they, they desired to worship themselves instead of God. And so now we have this world where we all do that. Where we make a God in our own image. Where God says something and we despise the word of God. So we go our own way. Makes sense. Now I can look in the world and I can start understanding it a little bit more. But if that was it, then I would say, but this... We live in a world without hope. And we're just in a world where we might as well just give up. If, if, if it's just creation and fall, then I'm, I'm done. I'm not going to go anywhere anymore. I'm going to sit at home and eat ice cream because that's all I can do. But even in the midst of the fall, in the midst of the curses that God has to justly bring upon creation because of the entrance of sin, we see a promise of hope and a promise of redemption. And so the rest of the Bible really is that working out. How is God going to bring redemption? And throughout these pages of Genesis, we've been giving these beautiful glimpses of God's redeeming work. Until ultimately, he's going to create a new creation, making all things new. Where we'll have a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells. All of this is the, the goggles that God has given us. So we can look at the world correctly and we can understand his word correctly. Because I, I, and I want to make a, a kind of a comparison this morning between if we just look at the world with our goggles, mankind's goggles, a, a, a secular point of view, or if we look at the world with a, a Christian worldview, God's goggles, then we're going to see the same circumstances a little bit differently. And so this morning, I want to break up chapter 50, this last chapter, into four basic sections. The first one is the death of Jacob. The second is a time of mourning. The third is the past revisited. And the fourth is the future uncertain. Or the uncertain future. I should have switched that because that would have made more sense. Making a note. But we're going to see that even if we walk through chapter 15 and we only look at it from a human standpoint, it's kind of depressive. It doesn't seem like Genesis ends the way we would want it to end. What is the last word? Look at the last sentence. Joseph, or the last verse. Joseph died. Being 110 years old, they embalmed him and he was put in a coffin in Egypt. The end. They all lived happily ever after. Right? Our hero is dead. And he's in the wrong place. This ain't good. How can that be the end? Because it's only the end of the beginning of the story. Right? Genesis is just the exposition. It's the last week on your favorite show. All these 50 chapters really are just to set up the rest of the Pentateuch or the rest of the next books of Moses, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. It's to give us the foundational understanding, the background work, so we end into the history of God's people and what he's going to bring out through it. He died. He's in Egypt. God's people are in Egypt. Egypt is a representation of the evil world. It doesn't end the way we think it should. But let's start from the top of this. Verse 1. This is, if we remember from last week, this is after Jacob now has blessed all his... First he blessed his grandchildren in 48. And then he brings the, his, his blessings upon his children, his sons, in verse chapter 49. Going through each of the 12 sons, setting up for us what we later know as the 12 tribes of Israel. Giving special uh, blessing to Joseph, one primarily of physical blessing but then there's something special that god does in judah or jacob does in judah to point forward that judah is going to be the one who brings spiritual blessing to god's people but now in chapter 50 after the blessings verse 1 joseph fell on his father's face why because 
right above it in verse 33, it says, After he had said his commands to his sons, Jacob died. He breathed his last. And that's the close of the chapter of what we call the patriarchs. Remember, and the, from here on out, when you talk about the one true God, if you want to identify the one true God, one way we do that is by talking about the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The God of the patriarchs. The God who made covenant with this one family is the one true God. The God who reveals himself to people in such a way that we can understand. This is the one true God. And now, the last of the patriarchs has died. Joseph, his son, his son who didn't see him for over 20 years, is now at his father's side, crying out because he now misses him. As his father he's loved so much is now gone. After this, what happens? They, they embalm him in order to preserve his body because they have a long journey to take him because he said, take me back to, to Canaan, take me back to the homeland so you can bury me there. They have him embalmed by the physicians, not by the priests, because in Egypt this would have been something that would have been looked at as a religious festival or celebration. You think of the pharaohs and the mummification processes they would have gone through to prepare them for you know, the next world in pharaoh land or whatever. But so it says very specifically, it wasn't the priests, it was the physicians that embalmed him, just for those purposes of travel. It takes 40 days to do that. And as they go, everybody begins to weep and to mourn the death of Jacob. In fact, it says the people in Egypt weep for 70 days. They begin this mourning process. Now that's really something that is reserved for royalty in Egypt, for pharaohs and other high-ranking officials. So it shows you the importance that, that Jacob and his family, because of what Joseph had done, they had in Egypt. That God takes this, really, this clan of misfits and shows his glory through them. That God can work through misfits. In fact, isn't that what he does all the time? That's who we are. We're, we're just a, a group of misfits by the grace of God. He's saved us from our sins. He's brought us together and he uses us. We're not the smartest. We're not the greatest. We're not the best looking. Well... <laughs> But God uses us for his glory. And we're thankful for that. They begin to mourn. They travel together. So many people are coming to bury Jacob in his homeland. And as they return, though, in verse 15, it says, When Joseph's brothers saw that the father was dead, they said, It may be that Joseph will hate us and pay us back for the evil that we did to him. Right? They're remembering once again, okay, we messed up. And we recognized it from time to time, but maybe Joseph was just being nice to us because, you know, good old dad. Maybe we're, we have it coming to us now. Dad's out of the picture, and now Joseph's going to remember what we did, and, and, you know, we shouldn't have thrown him in that pit. We shouldn't have sold him into slavery. Just those little things that we did. Yeah, he, he could have been mad for it. <coughs> And maybe he should have been. But how does Joseph respond? I, I, I find this interesting because I didn't recognize this until I reread it again this week a bunch of times. You know when you review something? Like if I was to say to you, what happens at the end of Genesis is his brothers came and they said something to him. They didn't even say it themselves. They sent messengers to do it. I, I guess I never caught that exactly until I was rereading it a lot. But they sent messengers to Joseph to say, hey, dad said you should forgive us still. I wonder if, that's a lie. It seems like they just made that up. Dad said you should forgive us still, even though he's dead now. That was the last thing he said. You, you were in the bathroom when he said it. Right? I don't know. because I don't see that in the text anywhere. But they're remembering the past. They have fear of what could happen now because of what they've done in the past. And it's, it's, it's scary to them. And then, again, the future is uncertain. I'm going to turn this down and turn it off. The future is uncertain because they're in the wrong place and Joseph dies. If that was the way we're looking at it, the patriarch is dead. 
We're all crying, and now my brothers are bringing up the past, and now Jake, Joseph dies. We're in Egypt. The end. That would be a bad way to look at it. That's just not a way to look at it. But that's what we're prone to. Because we're prone to say, in my life, this has happened. I, I, I don't get along with this person anymore. I never got that right job. Uh, I, I had a, a bad marriage. I had bad children. I struggled with drugs. I struggled with alcohol. I, I can't. All, whatever it is. And now what? And the future's uncertain. And I don't have anything. I'm just going to give up. How are we going to look at it? How do we look at who we are? How do we look at our past? How do we look at our present and where we're going in the future? And really, the key that helps us to bring this all together is Joseph's response to his brothers. And then when we go back, I think it helps us truly understand what God is doing. So verse 18 Actually, verse 19, after Joseph is dealing with his brothers, he says, Do not fear, for am I in the place of God? As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. That one sentence, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. If I could get you to believe anything, I want you to believe that sentence here today. Believe that all of this stuff and junk that can happen in this world, it doesn't matter necessarily what, what we look on the outside. How is God using it? And what is he going to do with it? The book of Genesis is giving us a foundation to see the rest of the Bible. For instance, death. Death is a bad thing, right? Death only comes because of sin. So when Jacob is mourning his father here, that, that's a good thing to do. We should. We should mourn. We should hate death. We should cry. When Jesus sees his friend is dead... He doesn't go, don't worry, guys, I'm going to bring him back in a few minutes. He weeps. Because this is not the way the world is supposed to be. But the Apostle Paul he tells us this. We are always of good courage. We know that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. Yes, we are of good courage. And we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim to please Him. We can weep when a loved one dies. But if they are in Christ, we weep in a different way than the world weeps. We weep with hope. Because we know that they are with Christ. They are with their Lord. The Apostle Paul in Philippians chapter 1, he, he says, I, I don't know, I, I want to be here to serve you, to love you, but I'd rather be absent with the body to be present with the Lord. That's far better. And he has priorities straight. And our priority should be to be with our Lord. But he says, but while I'm here, it's better for me to be here so I can teach you the things of God. Death is an enemy. But our Lord has defeated that enemy. In Revelation it says he throws sin and death into the lake of fire. It's not something that we have to stress about as followers of Christ. Yes, it, it, it can break us and it can make us sad, but ultimately we recognize that death is not the end. And Genesis is one of those, that's one of those goggles that we have. That, that, that we will praise our Lord when we leave these bodies. That we will be with Him. And we can have hope in that. 
They mourned for Jacob for 70 days, as it is right to do. Turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 with me. First Thessalonians chapter four. This is page nine hundred and eighty-seven in the Black Pew Bibles. First Thessalonians four, beginning at verse thirteen. This is one of those passages that is is a a favorite if if we're gonna be focusing too much on on the non-purpose of this passage. Everybody wants to go to this passage and and talk about eschatology and try to find a a one, two, three step plan. But what is this passage about? It's about hope. This passage is to encourage us when we're in Christ. Verse 13. This is, he tells us right in the beginning. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. Right? So what's the question that the church at Thessalonica is asking? Paul, we have these people, our family, they, they, they died. And, and what do we do now? He says you could grieve. It's sad. But we do it differently. We're sad in a different way when a loved one dies. Why? It's because what we know. Verse 14. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. Jesus died and rose again. That is core to who we are. It is foundational to the gospel itself. And if we believe that, then we know that those who have died in Christ, they will come to life again as well. They will be resurrected. Verse 15. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command and with the voice of an archangel and with the sound of the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. And then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. What's the end of it? Therefore, encourage one another with these words. We mourn, we grieve differently than the world around us. Oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin. If we're in Christ, that sting, we don't have to worry about that anymore. We have hope. The patriarch is dead. We mourn for Jacob. But we also remember, he himself says, bury me in Canaan. Because that is where we will be together. That is what God has promised us. And what does Jesus himself say? Jesus thought the gospel says, hey, you know how you call him the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? Well, he's not the God of the dead. He's the God of the living. And what is Jesus saying there? Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they did not cease to exist. They didn't just poof. But they're alive. They're with their Lord. He is the God of the living The way we look at our past helps us then to also see the present. Let's go back to Genesis chapter 50. Joseph's brothers are remembering what they have done in the past. They're ready for their past to catch up with them and cause trouble. We all have past things that have happened in our life. And um, sometimes it does catch up with us and get us in trouble. But in the long term, how do we think about our past? How do we think about what has happened to us in the past? 
Some of you have suffered greatly throughout various seasons in your life. Some of you have lost spouses. Some of you have lost children. You've struggled with pain, with health problems. You've had relationships become so fractured that even today they don't seem like there's anything that you could do to fix them. You have so many loved ones that are apart from Christ. And you've tried to share the gospel with them and they don't want to hear any of it. I can't tell you exactly why things like that happen. But what I can tell you is that none of them are meaningless. What I can tell you is that God is working through all those circumstances. Even if that seems like a superficial thing to say, it's not. <coughs> because as Jacob's br or Joseph's brothers are thinking about the past and what they did, what is Joseph seeing? He's not seeing their sin and their transgression through the eyes, the goggles that they have. He's looking at it through God's goggles. He's seeing the big picture of what God has been doing in there. Because think about this. When Joseph is in that pit and he's crying to his brothers, let me out of here, guys. Please don't kill me. Please save me. And he's scratching at the walls of this, trying to get out of there. And you were to say to him, hey, Joseph, stop being a baby. This is God's plan. That probably wouldn't be a good thing to say to him at that point. When he's thrown in prison because he's accused of something he didn't do. And he's saying, I didn't do that. I didn't do that. Yeah, right, you liar. Get in there. And they chain up his hands and they chain up his feet and he gets beaten. We don't say to him, hey, Joseph, don't worry about it. God has a plan. But what's the reality? The reality is, that's true. The reality is, when he is in the pit, God is doing something. Now, does that make it any less painful? No. Does that make him enjoy it or like it? Or... No, it doesn't. But is he able to look back and to see that God was doing something? He is. You might even be going through something right now. And that's why I'm saying seeing what God has done in the past helps us for here, right now, in the present. Whatever pit you might be in, whatever thing you've been accused of, whatever hard struggle you might be in, you're not, maybe you don't see what God is doing, but is he doing something? Could he be working something in this? Could he be teaching you something? Could he be saying, I want you to lean on me a little bit more. I want you to trust me a little bit more because you've been so self-sufficient. You've been able to pick yourself up by your bootstraps and, and use your savings in your bank and you've been able to do all that because you're so smart. But now I want you to trust me. So sometimes we need to fall down so we can say that God is the only one that can pick us up. Could God be doing something like that in your life? What I'm telling you is if you're in Christ, if you are a true follower of Jesus Christ, He is. Everything. Ephesians 1 says He works all things for His will, for His counsel. Romans 8.28, that verse we love so much. <coughs> he works all things together for the good of those who love Him and are called according to His purposes. All things, he's working it together. Yet at the same time, we find ourselves in these situations and perhaps we pray. Perhaps Joseph was praying when these things were going on to him. Lord, get me out of this. Lord, help me. And maybe you're in a situation where you're praying and saying, God, direct me. God, guide me. Give me the answers. And maybe you don't feel like those answers are coming. Or maybe you're not getting the answer you want or, or there's no change going on there. What do you do? Should we just give up? Should we say, oh, God doesn't care about me. God must be punishing me. God is cursing me for something that I did. Think about how each of these stories throughout the Bible are ultimately pointing us to Christ. Christ is the true and better Adam. 
Christ is the true and better Abraham, the true and better Jacob, the one who wrestles with God, the true and better Joseph, the true and better David, who his victory becomes his people's victory. Can you think of any time when Jesus was praying and it seemed like he had an unanswered prayer? Because one time Jesus took his disciples and he knew that he had to bear something that was going to be so unbearable that it would crush him completely. He said, come with me and watch and pray. And he puts his disciples there and he prays with them and he goes a little bit further and he starts to pray in such agony. He starts to sweat profusely. And he goes back in their sleep and he says, can't you wake up for a few minutes and just pray? And he goes again by himself and he starts to pray. And he says, Father, if you will, may this cup pass from me. I don't, I don't want to do this. This is, this is too much. May this cup pass from me. What cup? The cup of the wrath of God. Yet not my will, but yours be done. He prayed for the cup to pass in his humanity that would crush him. And what does he say when he's on that cross? Aloy, aloy, lama basaktani. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because that cup was not passed from him. He drank all of it. He drank the wrath of God. But it was because of that unanswered prayer... That, that prayer that didn't go exactly that, that, that he thought maybe it should go. That God did something. That God did the most amazing thing through the death of his own son, through the crushing of his own son. By his stripes we are healed because he took our wrath upon the cross. We can be forgiven. Now, if Jesus has this seemingly unanswered prayer or, or, or the Father does something in a way that that he does not see. Don't you think that when we pray and God doesn't seem to answer it in the way we think that he's either lost control or he doesn't know what he's doing or he just doesn't care? Or maybe he knows better than us. Or maybe he is doing something that we can't see right now. But he is working all things together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purposes. Is the future uncertain? Joseph is dead. He is in Egypt. He is in the coffin. But our future is not about where we are, but it's about where God is going to take us. It's about where Christ leads us as our king. Christ is our future. This is what makes it so important. I can't say to you that everything in your life has a purpose unless you're in Christ. It is not right for us to say that. It is not biblical. If, you're in, if, if, if bad things happen to you in your life and you're all the struggle and you are not in Christ, I can just say, oh, sorry. I'll pray for you. Why did this happen? I don't know. You made a dumb mistake. You made a bad decision. Sometimes people are mean. Perhaps... God is showing us that we need him. God resists the proud, but shows grace to the humble. So if you are feeling like things are broken, if you're feeling like God isn't answering your prayers, first ask yourself, am I in Christ? Do I trust in what God has done for me in Christ upon the cross? Do I believe that the word of God is sufficient and holy and perfect? And then as I read these words, I'm reading the very words of God. That I'm not trusting in my own righteousness, but Christ dying for me upon the cross for my salvation. If I don't understand this, then I'm not going to understand the rest of the book. If I don't see God sovereignly working through his people, through Abraham, through Isaac, through Jacob, through Joseph, then the rest of it's not going to make sense to me. But if I can read these words of Joseph again... What you meant for evil, God meant for good. Then the rest of the Bible is going to start becoming a little bit clear. 
Because there is so much evil in the heart of man. But God is not done with us. He's not done working. He's not done teaching. He's not done conforming us to the image of Christ. And for that we praise Him. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you so much. We thank you that you've given us this book, the book of Genesis and the great journey that we've had in it, seeing your wonderful creation, seeing how you work through uh, humans for your glory. We thank you, Lord, that you have saved us by your amazing grace. We thank you that even when we fail, you are good. That even when we seem lost, you're in control. That if we find ourselves in a pit, Lord, that we will see that you are working in it something. Maybe we don't understand it completely. But as we look to what you've done in the past, we'll trust you for the future. We know you'll be consistent with your character and nature. So guide us all, Lord, in our life. May we move forward trusting in your sovereign hand and loving you for who you are. We praise you, we love you, we worship you in Jesus' holy name. Amen.